Hello and welcome to the weekly discussion and today we are going to talk about the biological basis of behavior. Now, uh, before we begin, I want to uh, first of all uh, let everybody know that uh, I have spent some time and have moved my um, recording of these lessons and my synchronous teaching to uh, a new space that I transformed. Uh, my office uh, in the basement of my home has been transformed into a teaching studio. So I thought uh, for interest sake, I would show you around and show you what I'm doing as we uh, explore courses together. Uh, in this degree, I will be playing with the software and the technology that I have here to deliver both synchronous and asynchronous experiences. So take a tour. Let's let's, let's Let's look. So what do I have here? I have set up a space where I have a couple of computers and a variety of cameras, some lights to make things a bit brighter. I also have uh, integrated a larger television so that I can uh, see PowerPoints and when I'm zooming and or WebExing with my students I can see them all at one time uh, and uh, I also will be playing with the green screens and backgrounds uh, just to make things a little more interesting as I move through the teaching and learning so that's a tour of my office let's explore the biological basis of behavior in order to truly understand the biological uh, basis of behavior, we need to explore the anatomy of the nervous system, uh, which uh, has um, five key components, uh, the glia, which offers structural support, the neurons, which uh, helps with communication, the soma, which is about the cell body, the dendrites that receive an axon, which is a transmission. Behavior depends on rapid information travel and processing. The nervous system is the body's communication network and uh, this handles information just as the circulatory system handles blood. The basic components of the nurse, uh, nervous system are the living cells called neurons and glia. Glia are cells that provide structure and insulation for neurons or the natural glue. Neurons are cells that receive, integrate, and transmit information that permit communication in the nervous system. And a typical neuron consists of soma or cell body, dendrites, which are feeler-like structures that specialize to receive information, and an axon, which is a long, thin fiber that transmits signals away from the soma to other neurons or to muscles and glands. The basic flow of information is as follows. The dendrite receives a signal, and the signal passes through the soma and down the axon to the dendrites of another neuron. For efficient transmission to take place, uh, many axons are covered with an insulating material called myelin. Myelin sheaths speed up transmission of signals that along, move along the axons. Multiple sclerosis is a myelin degeneration disease causing loss of muscle control due to loss of transmission efficiency in the nervous system when the myelin sheaths deteriorate. At the end of an axon, the terminal buttons are small knobs that secrete chemical messengers called neurotransmitters. When the signal gets to the end of the axon, it causes these chemical messengers to be released into the synapse and the junction of the two neurons. The chemicals flow across the synapse and stimulate the next cell. Alan Hodgkin and uh, Andrew Huxley in the 1950s discovered the mechanics of the neural transmission by studying giant squids, which have axons that are about a hundred times larger than human axons. Uh, they found that fluids inside and outside the neuron contained electric charged particles and or ions. Uh, they also found that when uh, a neuron is at rest, the inside has more negative ions than the outside and the stable negative charge of neuron when it is an active is its resting potential. When a neuron is stimulated, channels of 
uh, in the cell membrane open briefly, allowing the positive ions outside the cell to flow to um, electrogenitive inside. Uh, this shift in the electrical charge travels along the axon and is referred to as the action potential. Uh, either an action potential occurs or it doesn't, but once an action potential is initiated, it goes full force. Absolute refractory period is the minimum length of time after an action potential during which uh, another action potential cannot begin. Neurons don't actually touch at a synapse. Instead, they are separated by a, what we call a microscopic gap between the terminal button of one neuron and the cell membrane of another neuron, or what we call the synaptic cleft. Uh, electrical signals can't jump this gap. Instead, the neuron is, that is sending the message across the gap, the presynaptic neuron, releases neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. This occurs when the action potential gets to the terminal button and causes the synaptic uh, vessels or vesicles, uh, storage sacs for the neurotransmitters, to fuse with the membrane at the end of the axon and spill its contents into the synaptic cleft. The neurotransmitters diffuse across the space where uh, they find an open receptor site on the postsynaptic neuron and these sites uh, recognize and respond to some neurotransmitters but not to others. When a neurotransmitter from a presynaptic uh, neuron crosses the synapse, finds an appropriate receptor site uh, on the postsynaptic neuron and binds, a voltage change occurs. This voltage change in the postsynaptic neuron is not an all for one uh, or none uh, situation. The neuron will fire or won't kind of thing. Uh, instead, it changes the probability or potential that the postsynaptic neuron will fire, and this is therefore called the postsynaptic potential. This uh, postsynaptic potential can be uh, excitatory or inhibitory. Uh, an excitatory potential makes the neuron more likely to fire and decreases the negativity of the inside of the neuron with respect to the outside. Uh, an, an inhibitory postsynaptic, postsynaptic potential increases the negativity of the inside of the neuron with respect to the outside, making it less likely to fire. So one neuron may receive signals from thousands of other neurons across thousands of different synapses. Each neuron must integrate the many signals arriving at the same time before it decides to fire. Uh, EPSPs together add up enough can cause the cell's voltage to reach the threshold at which the action potential will begin. And EPSPs and IPSPs may balance out as well, and the neuron may remain at rest. Um, thus, the state of the neuron is a weighted balance. Uh, thought occurs through the firing of millions of neurons in unison. Our perceptions, our thoughts, and our actions depends on patterns of neural activity in the interconnected neurons that fire together or sequentially neural networks. The links in these networks are constantly changing uh, with synapse uh, pruning or the elimination of old or unused synapses playing a larger role than the creation of new synapses in the sculpting of neural networks. So, so for example, the number of synapses in the human uh, visual cortex begins to decline after the age of one year. Neurotransmitters deliver their messages by binding to a receptor site in a lock and key kind of manner. Not just any receptor site uh, will do, there must be a perfect fit between the shape of the neurotransmitter and the shape of the receptor site. So some drugs mimic neurotransmitters fitting into receptor sites so perfectly that the site is fooled and a PSP is set up and these chemicals are called agonists. 
Other chemicals oppose the action of the NT. They bind to the receptor site, and but don't actually or really fit in well enough to fool the site. They just block the site. Right now, we know of about 15 to 20 substances that qualify as uh, neurotransmitters, NTs. Five are commonly researched. Uh, well, research has outlined many interesting connections between neurotransmitters and behavior. Most, bas most aspects of behavior are uh, probably uh, regulated by many neurotransmitters that are interacting. So let's look at the common neurotransmitters and some of their relations to behavior. Uh, if you look at the uh, table 3.1 on page 77 of our textbook, you will see that uh, we have a great little um, image here that describes uh, the various neurotransmitters, provides you some characteristics and relations to their behavior, and also describes disorders associated with uh, D or dysregulation of these particular neurotransmitters. So acetylcholine, uh, which is released by motor neurons controlling skeletal muscles, contributes to the regulation of attention, arousal, and memory, and uh, some uh, acetylcholine receptors are stimulated by nicotine, uh, and uh, in terms of dysregulation, uh, Alzheimer's disease is connected with the dysregulation of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Uh, dopamine contributes to control of voluntary movement. Uh, cocaine and amphetamines evade activity at the uh, dopamine uh, synapses, and dopamine circuits in medical um, a middle forebrain uh, bundle characterized as a reward pathway. In terms of dysregulation, Parkinsonism, schizophrenic disorders, and addictive disorders are connected with a dysregulation in dopamine. Norepinephrine contributes to the modulation of mood and arousal, and cocaine and amphetamines elevate activity at the uh, norepinephrine synapse. And many of the depressive disorders are connected with norepinephrine. Serotonin is involved in the regulation of sleep and wakefulness, eating, aggression, and Prozac and similar antidepressant drugs affect serotonin circuits. Uh, D, dysregulation and disorders associated with serotonin include depressive disorders, obsessive compulsive disorders, and eating disorders. GABA serves as a widely distributed inhibitory transmitters uh, contributing to uh, regulation of anxiety and sleep and arousal and Valium and similar anti-anxiety drugs work on the GABA GABA synapses. Uh, anxiety disorders are connected with dysregulation in GABA. Endorphins uh, resemble opiate drugs in structure and effects, play a role in pain relief and response to stress and contribute to regulations of eating disorders. So now we turn our attention to the organization of the nervous system and away from the neurochemicals or neurotransmitters. The nervous system has two main divisions, the central and the peripheral. The central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord, while the peripheral nervous system uh, consists of nerves that lie outside of the brain and the spinal cord. In the peripheral nervous system, afferent nerve fibers send information towards the central nervous system, while afferent nerve fibers send information away from the central nervous system. There are two divisions of the peripheral nervous system, the somatic or voluntary portion or the autonomic or the involuntary portion. The autonomic portion of the peripheral nervous system governs involuntary visceral functions such as heart and breathing rate and blood pressure. When, a, so for example, a person is automatically aroused, they speed up. This speeding uh, up is controlled by the uh, sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system, and the symp sympathetic uh, nervous system mobilizes the body's resources for emergencies and creates a fight or flight response. The parasympathetic nervous system, in contrast, activates processes that conserve bodily resources. So, for example, the parasympathetic nervous system slows heart rate down, reduces blood pressure. 